Leo, uh, I'm so thrilled to finally have you on 20 Minute Playbook. Thank you so much for making time and for joining me. Thanks, Daniel. I'm really excited to be here. So, you know, I always love to start with a recent fascination or obsession. Uh, And so, you know, my first question is what's captivating your attention or grabbing your imagination at the moment? What are you thinking about? Yeah, I think, you know, this is kind of cliche, but I think all of the generative AI stuff is really interesting. You know, the ability to like, you describe something and you get a paragraph about it or a blog post or, you know, an image or a video. I'm still not really sure where to invest there, you know, as a venture capitalist, although it's definitely, that's an interesting exercise. But also just thinking about like how fast that sector has moved over the last year or two and trying to think about like well, what will things look like in five or 10 years, right? Like, you know, will we have podcasts, for example, or like, is, are, you know, are you just going to have like a bot that can, you know, mimic me well that like you can ask it questions and it'll answer better than I could or something, right? It's definitely an interesting area. And so I've been kind of playing around with some of the tools and reading about it. And it's, it's, it's been fun to go down the rabbit hole. Plus all the generated art is like really stunning. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's either amazing or it's totally cringeworthy, but yeah. you know, that stuff you, you <laughs> normally creepy. never get shared. Yeah. yeah or yeah. creepy. <laughs> get shared. You know, I want to ask a kind of a one level deeper question, which is, you know, I imagine this probably happens somewhat often as a VC where you see some technology emerge. You have no idea how big it's going to get, how durable it's going to be, you know, if it's going to be monetizable. Do you have a process or a way you approach thinking through those to determine if you want to invest in them or not? I think everyone has a bit of a different process. I would say I do like to chat with people in my network, especially, you know, like we're more of a generalist investor. We'll invest across a lot of sectors, but there's a lot of specialists out there. And so like, for example, for something like generative AI, like I can read some blog posts and like, you know, go on Twitter and see what people are saying, but I can also try to find, you know, four or five like AI oriented investors in my network who probably have like kind of a much deeper, more interesting sense of where things might go. And then I'll ask them for their thoughts, like we'll kind of compare notes. And I think that's a good way to learn. Uh, I do think also reading and Twitter and, you know, kind of playing around with the tools yourself uh, is interesting. Yeah, that's a great way. Okay, moving on. You know, you're one of three co-founders and general partners at Sousa Ventures, where you've been part of some incredible investments, you know, Flexport, Steady, Andela, Robinhood. Um, the question that I wanted to ask, I'm going to ask a couple of questions around Sousa Ventures, is if you had to compress down the common traits of the best founders you've worked with, what would those be? And how do you think about what those common traits are? I've tried to do some like retrospect, uh, retrospective analyses on the investments we've made and like kind of try to figure out like well, what made some of the the ones that have done better, like what, you know, was there something in the early days that predicted that? And I would say on the founder side, probably like the the three things we've seen that make a difference is, you know, one is it's somebody that is great at inspiring people to work with them, right? And it could be, that could be charisma. It could be, maybe it's not charisma. Maybe it's like you're in some sector that people are really, you know, excited to be a part of, right? Like maybe you're helping with education or healthcare or climate change or things like that. Um, but just basically somebody that, you know, because of either personal traits or like traits about their company, they're going to have an easier time recruiting investors and employees and customers. So I think, I think that's an important trait. I think another one is founder market fit, especially on the B2B side. What that means is, you know, whatever product you're making, whatever, you know, customer segment you're selling to, you have a little bit of experience with that segment. Maybe you, you would have been the ideal customer in a previous job. Maybe you've worked with the types of customers that you're targeting or like you understand the industry well. I don't think this is a requirement, but it's definitely something where you can avoid a lot of like newbie mistakes in a sector if you have a little bit of experience in the sector. And I'd say the last one that's maybe a little bit more unusual is like, I think just like not uncomfortable to, you know, like not afraid to do things that feel uncomfortable or foreign. Because I think especially for like a CEO, the company changes so much between, you know, one person and like a thousand people and your job changes a lot. And there's going to be parts of it that you like that you don't want to let go of, but you have to, right? Because maybe, maybe you write some code on day one, you shouldn't be writing it on day a thousand. And on the flip side, there might be things that you don't want to do. Like maybe you don't want to fire people, you don't want to manage like a big team or manage managers. And those are also things that you just have to be willing to be like, you know, it's not comfortable or it's not something I love doing, but like, I just got to do it for the company. And so I think people that have that attitude tend to do a bit better. Yeah, it seems like that last one you cited is really helpful in terms of founders not being the bottleneck for their own company's growth, <laughs> which is obviously going to be important. You don't want to you know, gate that any more than you need to. Switching over, if you had to try to compress down everything you've learned about making good early stage bets, because you guys are seed focused, so early stage bets on either founders, problem spaces, and products, um, what would those be? You know, Are there any rules of thumb? Is there anything emerged from that retrospective? Yeah, I would say, you know, 
It's a broad question, so my answer will be maybe a little bit higher level. Uh, as I mentioned, I think founder market fit is important. And I would say, like, the more complex or antiquated a domain, like, I think the more value there is there, right? So, you know, if, it, if it's, like, the kind of industry where, like, a new college guy could figure it out in a month, then great. Like, you don't need founder market fit. You know, if you're, I don't know, selling software to power plant operators or, like, or you're trying to launch some consumer product in another country, like, you need to understand how people like buy things in that country, right? Or what kind of products they like, or, or how power plant operators like, you know, buy software. And if you don't, you're probably going to waste three or six or all of your, like three or six months, or maybe all of your runway, like trying to figure that stuff out. Um, so I think founder market fits really important. You know, this is kind of a generic statement, but I think for problem spaces and segments, like you want there to be tailwinds instead of headwinds. This is sort of like a, kind of an obvious thing, but you want it to be like, hey, regulation is pushing for people to like adopt your product rather than stop buying it, right? Or um, or you want something to be like kind of a, a space that people are excited to work in rather than they hate working in it. And I would say the last thing is, and this one's harder to find, I think something in the company should be exceptional and ideally kind of tied to the problem or the, you know, the market that the company is going after, right? But like maybe it's a founder's ability to recruit, maybe it's our understanding of a space Maybe it's like the product is just incredible in some way that no one else has been able to copy. But I think usually there's something incredible about like really strong companies, even in the early days. Yeah, there's some some area in which they like spike off the charts and in which they're just incredibly impressive. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, you know, I, I want to kind of flash back a little bit. You've been building SUSE now. You guys found it, founded it in 2012. You've been building it, you know, for roughly 10 years. And so, you know, I'm curious, uh, what do you wish someone sat you down and told you before you decided to found SUSE Ventures, you know, a decade ago? Or, and it may be said another way or asked another way. What are some of the biggest surprises that you've had to learn and overcome over the last decade? I think there's two that come to mind. So I'd say one is that you really don't have any agency. Right. And so like, it's very much like maybe in later stages where you have a board seat and you can vote on company issues, like you have a little bit more uh, authority, but at seed stage, like you're kind of an advisor and you can give advice and no matter how good or bad, or like how much data you have to back it up, like the founder can just say like, well, I don't, you know, I don't agree with it. So I'm not going to like, listen. And, you know, like sometimes the advice is like just a hunch. And so like, it makes total sense for the founder to not listen. And other times, you know, you can say something like, oh, I've seen 30 companies do this, 29 of them failed. I think you should like, I don't think you should do this. And, you know, and the founder could still be like, well, I think I'm going to be one of the 30, like, screw you. <laughs> uh, and, and all you can do is kind of like sit by and be like, well, I, I hope it works out. But I think that lack of agency was something that surprised me. And I think the other thing is just like, the feedback loops are really poor, right? In the sense that, for a, like a really good company, it might take them, you know, six, eight, 10 years to like before the IPO or have a great exit. And along that journey, like you don't really know how, you know, it like was this a good investment or not. And and there's kind of short term indicators that might suggest if it was good or not. But like even those are pretty misleading, right? Like maybe somebody raises more funding. And so that seems like a good sign, but that doesn't mean anything about long term success. Like the company could still fail. And so it's just very hard to kind of fine tune your own ability to like pick companies, you know, figure out like what's, what's good and what's bad and what to look for and what not to look for. So I think that was kind of a surprise. Yeah. On the agency side, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating observation. I haven't heard anyone, you know, kind of state it quite that way has just experiencing that, you know, um, I don't know, friction or inability to try to shape things a little bit more actively, um, you know, made you all think about trying to get a board seat? Is, are you just philosophically opposed to that? I mean, have you it, basically, have you, has that made you question doing more to try to have more agency or is it just more accepting? Nope. It's just part of how it works. <laughs> yeah. I think it's probably more accepting than being zen about it. I mean, cause the truth is like in the end, it's the founder's company. Right. And so like, I don't like, unless there's fraud or something, I don't really feel like it's my place to be like, Hey, you want to take a product in this direction. I'm going to overrule you and you go in that direction. Like, I don't, th you know, so I'm not really interested in board seats from that perspective. I think if anything, like one is it's tried, it's made me a little bit more Zen about, you know, like I, 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 you know, said what I said, I tried to give whatever data I could. And then, you know, now it's, now it's out of my hands. And then I think the other part is like, just trying to, you know, find ways to be more compelling, right? Maybe it's presenting more data. Maybe it's connecting somebody to like another founder that did something that worked or didn't work before uh, that the founder is considering stuff like that. 
Okay, I want to switch it up and talk a little bit more about just your day-to-day. You know, um, I know you work incredibly long days. <laughs> you're mostly seated, just meeting with, a, you know, an incredible number of founders during the day. Uh, so one of the questions that I wanted to ask is what sorts of values or standards you bring to your work every single day? And, and what's important to you about how you show up, both for the founders and for your team at Seuss Ventures? I mean, I'd say for me, like kind of honesty and integrity and like personal reputation are you know, probably my top priority. Because I forget who it was. Maybe it was like the Charlie Munger or something that said, you know, like reputation takes like decades to build and like seconds to ruin. So I definitely believe in that. I So I, I always want to feel like I'm doing the right thing or like I'm doing right by, by founders, by my team. So I think that's a top priority. I would say in terms of how I like to work with people, I try to be non-judgmental and just like kind of help wherever I can. And I would say like that's regardless of like if a company is doing well or poorly. And I think there's a few reasons for that. I think one is, like, honestly, being judgmental doesn't really help, right? So, like, if you do something and I'm like, that was stupid, like, you know, okay, the, the, that's not really going to improve the company from here on out. But I think also, if you're not judgmental, like, it creates a much better relationship, right? Where, you know, if the first time you tell me about a problem, I say it's stupid, like, you're not going to tell me about the next five problems. But if you tell me about the first one or two, and I'm like, pretty easy going about it, I'm like, well, what can we do to make it better? Then I think that creates a lot more trust. And and then like we can work together even more effectively in the future and just try to make the company more successful. And maybe the last thing I'd say is like, this is a little bit like, uh, I don't remember the exact roles, but like there's like Asimov's rules of robotics, which is like, you know, robots can't hurt humans. They can't like hurt themselves. And I, I forgot what the third one was. And I think a little bit of that is like how I think about working with founders, which is like, I think the company is the number one priority, which is like always just want to make the company successful because I think that makes everyone happy. And then a very close second is the founder. Right. So like, unless it's going to kill the company, like, you know, very supportive of the founder. And then I think like Sousa and my success are like tertiary. Uh, but on the flip side, I think if like, if we can help companies succeed and help founders succeed, I think that the success of Sousa and myself will, will follow. Makes sense. I, I want to go a little bit more meta and, and talk about areas where you feel like you have an edge or a superpower. You know, we're not really going to cover it in this episode, but you have a fascinating background where you spent, you know, a number of years as an engineer working in a bunch of the best tech companies before becoming an investor. So you have this technical background. So I'm curious, you know, what do you think of as your superpowers and how do those show up day to day in your work and, and or your life? A couple that come to mind. So I'd say one is I don't talk about it too much, but like, I'm really good at math, especially like, you know, napkin math or like mental calculations. I, I used to be a math contest kid in high school and did pretty well in those. And I think that's actually like a pretty good asset because a lot of times somebody's talking about market sizing or a business model or like, you know, showing a financial projection. And I don't need to like, kind of like go home and think about it for a few days. Like I can kind of look at it and be like, oh, you have this number here. Like you said, your margins are this. It doesn't really line up. Can you explain this? And so I think it's given me a good like BS meter and a good way of kind of like analyzing markets a lot of the time, like on the fly. And I would say as an engineer, I think like being a, like a structured thinker is something that I'm pretty good at. And what I mean by that is like a lot of times, like you have some complicated scenario and I'm pretty good at being like, okay, well, like let's map out all the paths. And like, if you do this path, like here are the things that can happen. And, um, and, and kind of really thinking about things in that structured methodical way, which I think sometimes, you know, uncovers like deeper problems or uncovers like creative solutions or things like that. So I'd say that's another strength. And maybe the last one I'll say is like, you know, I'm not above doing like grungy work, right? So a lot of times like somebody would be like, oh, give me feedback on an app, right? Or like, you know, send me like 30 investor intros and I'm happy to do that stuff. I just want to try to be helpful. I think there are definitely VCs like that, but there's also a lot of VCs that are sort of like, hey, I'll help you with like strategic advice from time to time, but I don't really want to get like into the nitty gritty. And I think a lot of times like that nitty gritty is actually like pretty valuable. Totally. Because there's an enormous amount of work required in something like 30 introductions <laughs> as opposed to, you know, a 30 minute strategic phone call on something that you're, you know, naturally good at. Yeah. And I would say like, you know, if you think like maybe kind of go back to the math thing, if you think of like, let's say a strategic, like an intro has some value, right? Like 10% chance to close a customer, the customer is worth like, worth like 10 grand. The difference between me sending like five intros and 30 is actually like a lot of money to the company. And so to me, it might feel like, oh, it's kind of annoying. Like I just have to send all these like emails. They all look the same. And it's like kind of busy work, but it's actually like, it could be really high value, right? Like I just have to do more of it. 
Yeah. Well, it is a good example there of like trying to compute the value of each of, you know, the probability and the potential value of each of these introductions. And then thinking about that, obviously compounded over different numbers. Um, I, I, I want to double click on something you talked about there, which is, you know, having a BS meter. And, and the question I guess I want to ask is, you know, as you think about, you know, meeting with founders, hearing pitches, trying to wade, you know, wade through learning about a company to making a decision, how much of that process is BS meter, you know, where you're using the BS meter to effectively just try to say, no to things or find areas of concern versus more kind of maybe top side or upside maximization. Yeah, there's always a tension here. So I think on the flip, on one hand, you're looking for something exceptional. And sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes you have to kind of ask a bunch of questions to see if there's something there. I think the BS meter is a big part of it. There are definitely like common categories of BS, right? So I would say like numbers is one. I would say like kind of self-awareness is another one, right? If someone's like painting a very rosy picture and anytime you're like, well, is this a risk or is this going to be a problem? And everything's kind of just waved off as like, no, 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 like, don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. I think that usually signals, you know, kind of like a little bit more smoke and mirrors and, and BS. But but there is a tension, right? Because a lot of times, like even great companies, like they'll have some things wrong with them in the early days or some things that they have to figure out. And so you are trying to like find those things and be aware of them. And if someone like acts like there's nothing like you know for the company to figure out, that's usually not a good sign. But also like you don't want to be so blinded by like you know, hey, there's like a couple minor flaws that like you miss the you know you miss the big opportunity for that. Yeah. Hey, I want to ask a related question, which is just around, you know, I, I imagine at this point you've sat through thousand plus pitches. I don't know if you track the number, but I'm sure it's very, very, very high, much higher than. It, it's probably a couple thousand in person over 10 years. Uh, and then probably, you know, I can't even imagine the number of decks, probably like 20,000 decks over 10 years or something like that. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> let's just round up. We'll, we'll go from a thousand to, you know, 22,000 or 20,000, um, which, is, which is an enormous volume. You know, and you talked about part of that process there where you're trying to Zo- you know, kind of zoom in on things or be aware of things that might be concerning. I guess, you know, flipping to the opposite side, the question that I want to ask is, you know, having seen just that volume of decks, what have you learned about what makes a great pitch? And I think part of that is just components or the way that a pitch comes across and how much of that's more narrative versus the founder themselves. I think there's a few attributes to this. So first, you want to have like a good story arc and you want it to be, you want to sort of like, have the story build so that by the time you finish hearing the pitch, it like the success of the company sort of feels inevitable. Um, And by story arc, what I mean is like sometimes pitches just sort of come as like disjointed facts, right? Where, you know, I can be like, oh, I worked at LinkedIn in the early days and then I started SUSE. Oh, and by the way, like I was born in Russia and I lived in Cupertino, like after we moved here, it was like, that's just like a bunch of random facts, but it's, you know, it's not coherent. But I think if you kind of paint this arc of like, okay, here's the problem. And then like a bunch of people have tried these different approaches, but here's how we're solving it. And we've got some validation from customers that this is the right approach. And like, you kind of keep building and building and building. And then by the time, like the, the investor here, like has heard the whole pitch, they're you know, really excited and convinced. So I'd say that's one piece. Like you want to have that good story arc to the earlier point. I think you do want to be self-aware and, you know, kind of have a good sense of like, here's our strengths. Here's, here's the risks. And a lot of times that's presented as like, here's what we want to do in the next year or two to like eliminate those risks or figure them out. And then I do think some of it does come back to the founder, right? Which is like, is the pitch sort of like, you know, is there a little bit of like charisma and energy and like excitement where you're, you're kind of listening to them and you're like, okay, I really would love to work with this person. I think others would love to work with them, both investors and employees and others. And so I think that is like another element that's, uh, you know, it's pretty important. Yeah. I want to move to a diff- very different topic. You know, one of my favorite things to ask guests about is just their favorite books. And um, so you kind of the way that I want to ask this question for you is, you know, I'm curious if you could just share, just zooming way, way out the the books that have had an outsized impact on you just as a person. And then, you know, putting on your kind of investor founder hat on, are there any books that either you see have a big impact for a, quite, you know, a large percentage of founders um, and or are there books you regularly recommend to, to founders that you all invest in? Yeah, I would say. On the personal side, one book that really comes to mind is it's called A Guide to the Good Life. Maybe it's kind of a cliche thing to say, but like it's about stoicism. And it's like the only book I've read on the subject. And I found it really interesting because a lot of it's sort of, you know, I talked earlier about like kind of being able to be a little bit zen when you don't have agency. And a lot of the book does bring up things like that, right? Which is like, okay, you have one life to live. Like, you know, don't waste it being like, angry or sad or like, you know, frustrated with your situation or whatever. It's more like, Hey, what's in your control, like work on things that are in your control, try to make them better. 
things that are out of your control, like ignore them, right? Because literally like they're out of your control. So, you know, stressing out or trying to do things to them, like doesn't matter if you can't have an impact. It also talks about, you know, just a lot of these like stoicism related concepts, like, you know, being more happy with what you already have, right? And kind of reminding yourself of like how much, you know, maybe things could be a lot worse, right? And, and so I think that that's been like, just like something that's really resonated with me in terms of personal attitude. On the business side, I'd say two books I recommend highly. One is called Traction uh, by Gabe Weinberg and Justin uh, Maris. And that one's about marketing, but I would say it's, you know, it's written for like almost for an engineering audience where it's like before reading it, I always thought marketing and go to market was a little bit of like a fuzzy art rather than a science. And this book is very much like, well, here's an algorithm, right? Like, you know, here's like a few dozen channels you could think about. And here's, you know, you should like pick 10, do a bunch of like thousand dollar experiments you know, pick three, do like $5,000 experiments and then like double, like go all in on the top one. And then here's like the mistakes people make in picking a channel. And and to me, it's like this 150, 200 page book, but it's really succinct and crisp and tactical. Um, and I found it really like a good recommendation, especially for founders that do come more from the, like the technical and non-business side. And then another book I, I recommend a lot is called Monetizing Innovation. Uh, and that one's basically about how to price products and how to think about pricing strategy and how to uh, think about pricing earlier on. And I think pricing is one of those like underappreciated areas because, you know, like if I told a startup, like, hey, can you triple your revenue in the next two months? The answer is almost certainly like no from growth, right? Because you probably can't triple your customer base in three months. But a lot of times, like you could probably triple it in a few months with like smarter pricing. And I think it's, that's not like a lever people think about a lot. And a lot of times, like the pricing is like just wildly under-optimized. And so I think this is a good book in, uh, to like, to introduce people to how to think about pricing, how to optimize it, how to get more value from customers while delivering a lot of value to customers. Yeah. Huge plus one there just to think about pricing. Cause I think a lot of founders either don't think about it, think about it way too late or think about it two dimensionally. Meaning like it's, you know, just like, is it monthly? Is it annual? Is it this price point? Is it this price point? As opposed to thinking in experiments and more three dimensionally. I want to ask a question around habits and, you know, the question I want to ask is what tiny habit or practice has had the biggest positive impact um, on your life and your work. And this can be anything, including super small stuff, like just reflecting each night, planning your day each morning. What comes to mind? There's, Two that come to mind. One is I started working with an EA a few months ago, and that's been really game changing in terms of just like writing down a bunch of kind of playbooks and procedures, some, some for my EA and some for myself, just because there are so many things where like I do them one off, I do them every like six months or a year. And I kind of reinvent the wheel every single time, right? Like there'd be something like, oh, I need to renew my insurance. And it's like a 20 minute process. And it could be like three minutes if I just wrote down the steps once and followed them each year. Uh, but I never did that. And so I think starting to write down some of these things where I know I'm going to do something, you know, on a recurring basis and trying to make it as like as streamlined as possible for either for myself or for my EA that I work with. I think that's been like pretty helpful and that's more of a small habit. I would say one other one that like is a little more time consuming, but I found really valuable is just maybe every quarter or two, I'll try to review all of my investments, like basically all my investments ever. And just think about like what's happened with them in the last quarter or two. And is there like a new lesson I should be extracting there? And then, you know, if there is like, I'll try to write that down and, and, you know, kind of review those lessons from time to time. And I think that's helped me both, you know, be a slightly better picker over the last decade, uh, but also it's helped me like, you know, have better advice for companies over the last 10 years, right? Because I can, I actively reflect on like what works and what doesn't. And then I, you know, incorporate that into the, like when I talk to founders later on. Yeah. Well, and that's a great example of like taking something where to your point, the feedback loop can be just awful and happen over an eight to 10 year period and effectively forcing a feedback loop that's much, much shorter, you know, and, and forcing yourself to reflect. Last question. Um, if you could go back to the start of your career and whisper some words of advice, a reminder, anything, you know, what would you tell your younger self? Well, th this one's about the venture business, but I think it applies to a lot of other industries. I think there's like a lot of cargo cult thinking, if you've heard that term. I have not heard that term, actually. It was this really interesting term. I think Richard Feynman uh, made it popular in like some commencement speech a few decades ago. And the gist was, and I might mangle this story, but like, I think it was during World War II, um, there were, you know, like in some of the, the islands in the Pacific, uh, you'd have U.S. planes, you know, fly by the islands, drop off uh, supplies and then fly away. And, you know, whenever that happened, like the the native population of that island would see like somebody on the ground with like headphones kind of raiding into a, like a, you know, to a plane and being like, Hey, drop off like some food over here. And after world war two, like the planes left, like, like the American troops left, 
And some of these like native populations, they made like headphones out of wood because they kind of thought like, oh, like if I just like speak into a device that looks like this, like I'll get food. But like that, that, that actually like that was sort of like the wrong lesson, right? It was like the superficial lesson. And I think there's a lot of that in a lot of industries, especially venture, which is like, oh, this is how things get done or this is what someone successful did. So I'm going to copy that. But it might be that like, well, their success isn't from the thing you're copying. It's from like something else. And you're sort of like spending all your time copying the wrong things. And I think that's a lesson I learned pretty quickly in venture because there were a lot of these like things people took for granted. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, I was told like by a bunch of people early on to like not send direct feedback to founders if we passed. And the the hypothesis or like the thing everyone said was like, oh, it gives you a lot of option value because if you don't upset a founder today by telling them you don't like their company, maybe the next round, like they'll still come back to you and like, you know, they'll let you invest and you can invest later on, even if you miss something good. And my experience has been the opposite, which is like, I'll give people feedback and I'll be like, hey, here's some things I like, here's some areas of hesitation. And, you know, I actually get a lot of founders either coming back to me for their next round or like sending their friends to me because they like the feedback and they miss it for most investors. And, and I think that's something where, you know, I just kind of thought about it more from a first principle standpoint, which is like, if I was a founder, I'd want to know like what people don't like. And then maybe I could disagree, maybe I can change it if I do agree, like, but at least it's some data. And so like, to me, it just felt weird to not say anything and just be like, oh, sorry, it's too early, I'm passing. So I just gave people like specific feedback and it turned out to be a good decision. But that's like one of the many things I've seen where it's like people just do things because it's how they're done versus like because of how it should be done. Do you have any hypotheses around why that's, uh, you know, so prevalent in venture in particular? Like, is it because the industry is not that old? Is it because you have a lot of people that have very varied experiences trying to compare notes? I think because venture is such an outlier driven business, it's, you know, like everyone's trying to learn from outliers, but the outliers are like very idiosyncratic. Right. And like, like I kind of, I've given this silly example a few times, but like you could look at the last 10 years and be like, oh, I should invest in any company with like a four letter German name. Right. Cause like Uber is like a you know hundred billion dollar company. And like, that's maybe more of like a cargo cult learning, which is like, you're, it's not like, that's a superficial thing. That's not, that's not why Uber succeeded. But I think it's, it's very easy to extract lessons from just like a few folks. Right. Which is like, Oh, like Fred Wilson or Bill Gurley, they, they backed like five unicorns or 10 unicorns and everyone else struggles to find one. And so whatever they're doing, I'm going to copy. And like, maybe you're right, maybe you're not. But I think if there was, I think if it was less power law driven and less outlier driven and more like methodical and data driven, you could probably just look at the data and be like, oh, I should do this because like 80% of companies that succeed, like do that, like want this and I shouldn't do that because of the opposite. But because it's so outlier driven, like I think it's very easy to just overgeneralize from like really small samples. Totally. And it's really hard to, to your point earlier, there's lots of lessons you can learn that are the wrong lessons to take away from whatever particular data point or story, you know, happened. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on, Leo. I, I really appreciate it. That yeah, was a blast. Thanks for having me.